I didn't know what anxiety was until nine years ago. That's when I got clinically diagnosed. Songs like Beanie Siegel, Feel It in the Air. Feeling, yeah. Jay-Z, Screech is watching. You know, Ghetto Boys, Mind Playing Tricks on Me. Those three songs, to me, captured the feeling of what it, uh, what it was I was going through. And they actually normalized it. That's probably why I never thought it was a problem. I never thought I needed any help. But I just felt like for the lifestyle that I was living, being in the street, right. selling crack in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, that's how I was supposed to feel. I thought that paranoia came with the territory. What's up, geniuses? Welcome back to For The Record, and I'm your host, Rob Markman. Now, today's guest is one of the top voices in hip-hop and black culture overall, man. Best radio show, my favorite radio show. Don't tell my other friends. Before <laughs> <laughs> He's on TV, and on October 23rd, he's going to be in your bookstores with his second book, Shook One. The Anxiety's Playing Tricks On Me. And man, I tell you, it's going to be a bestseller. Hey. Charlemagne the God, welcome to For The Record. What's up, my brother? Chilling, bro, Rob, man. Rob's one of the few people I talk to like every day. We got a group chat, so. We definitely we, got a group it's, chat. It's always some type of messaging going on uh, every day. Yeah, now I, <laughs> and, and, you, and you put it in the book. I didn't know if we wanted to keep the group chat a secret and kind of like our secret alliance. Like, this is where we really get to talk <laughs> our shit when we don't want to go on Twitter. Absolutely. When it's like, and, and we kind of bounce ideas off of each Absolutely. other, Absolutely. But I've always appreciated you. I've always appreciated your voice, Thank you. your insight, and then at the end of the day, just a fan of your work, man. Same man, here. Absolutely. You know the feeling's mutual. Yeah, man. So this new book, man, um, Shook Ones, Anxiety's Playing Tricks on Me. Um, Black Privilege was your first book. Yes, sir. Um, and I, I learned a lot about you in reading that book. Even though we're friends, I, I felt like I learned more about you than ever reading that book. And with this one, I learned even more. There was things that you were going through, like you said, we speak every day, mm -hmm. that I had no idea. Um, when did you decide? I feel like this is more personal than 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 the first. It is. It's more. It's more. I would say it's more vulnerable. You know. Um, I think the first book. I've never had a problem being transparent. I mean, I don't have no problem sharing a story. Like I can mm -hmm. tell you a story that happened to me, or tell you an experience I went through. But I think you know it's a difference between transparency and vulnerability because vulnerability is me basically saying how it made me feel. You know, or or expressing. You know. Just, just feelings I, I was going through based off some of the experiences I went through. So I think this book is more vulnerable. I guess that's personal. I don't know. Yeah. Nah, yeah. Definitely. Why now? Why? What? What made you want to write it? Um, it's interesting, man. You know, the publishers was coming to me, wanting another book, right? And I don't ever move off money because we all know whenever you, we can tell in hip hop when somebody does something for the money. Right. The second something is always probably the corniest shit. Because, because you could tell like they just got that check right. or they did that because they was getting a bigger advance, you know what I mean? And so I was like, you know what? I'm, I, I can't do that. I refuse to do that. And I was sitting on, in a, on an island last year, Anguilla, which is my favorite spot to go vacation. And you know, I'm real big on these big family friend vacations. So I got like my daughters there, my nieces, my niece and my sister and my in-laws and you know, my wife and friends. And I'm getting a haircut by the pool. And I had just like this feeling of serenity, wow. like this feeling of peace. And I was like, yo, I, ain't, I have not felt like this in a minute. So I'm like, yo, I, I want to bottle this up and take it with me. So I was like, how can I feel like this all the time? And I already was flirting with the idea of therapy, mm -hmm. like talking to people I know who go to therapy or I overhear somebody talking about therapy and ask them, what is it like? And so that's what made me say, you know what, if, if therapy can make me feel like this all the time, if I can get a grasp on my anxiety in this way, Cool, that's what I'm gonna do. So when I started going to therapy, you know, I started to realize that anxiety is a mental health issue. It's actually the number one mental health issue in America. And I started realizing that, you know, based off what I was telling my therapist, she started telling me I got PTSD and I got trauma, you know, from, from past experiences that I was dealing with. You gotta think I'm unpacking 40 years of bullshit. Right. You know, I stuff that I've right. never talked about in depth, stuff that I've always suppressed. Cause you know, that's we we from the hood. When you're from the hood, you feel anything that makes you feel any kind of pain or anything that is going to make you feel vulnerable or soft or weak, you kind of like step right. on that. Like I can't even, I'm not even dealing with that. I'm going to marginalize that in my mind immediately. Right. And it's just like, yo, these were things that I was just finally opening up and expressing to the world. So I just decided to like, you know, put it down in like the journal. And you know, as I'm writing like journal form, I'm like, hell, this is the book, right. you know? And then um, when I started realizing this, it's becoming this, you know, book about 
mental health just based off the fact that I realized anxiety is a mental health issue and, you know, PTSD and trauma and all that stuff like that and me going to therapy. I was just, you know, documenting it all. And I was like, this is the book. So I reached out to my man, Dr. Ish Major, you know, and Dr. Ish Major is a, is a, a mental health therapist. He's a, he's a brother who graduated from the University of South Carolina. So everything that I explain in the book, all these feelings I'm talking about, like from parental paranoia to... Black annoyed, right. you know, that's the feeling of being black and paranoid in America. He gives clinical correlations right. to all of those at the end of every chapter. Because you're writing from your personal experience, yes. very much in, in, um, in layman terms, in, in language that we can all understand, but then it gets correlated to clinical terms yeah. with Dr. Ishmael. I'm not an expert. Which is helpful, right. Yeah, I'm just, I just got experiences. I'm not an expert right. at none of this. Which I've I seen a lot of what makes him think he could talk about mental health. He's not an expert, but you're an expert in the way of you live with it every day. Yeah. And, and you're trying to, 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 Figure your way out through life That's while it. carrying this with you, and I'm still figuring it out. This, right. this, don't get it twisted. Don't think that this is a, you know, self help book that's going to give you some magic remedy to cure your anxiety. No, I'm just a brother that's going through it. I'm sharing my story, and hopefully, me sharing my story will make you comfortable with sharing your story and going to seek help, which is which is therapy. One of the things I I, I really liked about this book, you know, you talked about Dr. Ish Major correlating your, your personal experience into more medical terms, and the way you used hip hop um, to really illustrate a lot of what you were feeling. You know, the book is called Shook One. If you don't know, that's that's a Mob Deep Mob reference. Deep, Rest baby. in peace to Prodigy. And yes, sir. Anxiety playing tricks on me as Ghetto Boy, Scarface, Willie D. Bush, yes, Bill. Um, but you know, hip hop for me, and and I've never gone to therapy. Um, reading this book made me think about it, like, might I need some? But hip hop for me has always been a form of therapy. And I, you know, I want to go back. Um, Post Malone gave this quote in an interview, which he 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 why clarified. We, he walked it back. Why are we back. quoting Post Malone? <laughs> Listen, no, because it angered me. And you know me, like yeah, usually yeah. I, I let stuff go. Like if anybody's really critical about me, it's like, man, Rob don't really go in on nobody, or Rob. Because yeah. I'm like, yo, I don't care. But Post Malone has said this thing, which he since walked back, but it bothered me. And the, and the quote was like, you know, if you're looking for lyrics, if you're looking to cry, if you're looking to think about life. Don't listen to hip hop. And he went on and talked about how Bob Dylan allows him to be that emotional. And I was really confused because for me, as a hip hop fan, hip hop has always allowed me, I've always felt feeling the first time I heard my mind's playing tricks on me. 100 percent You know, um, we're looking up there. I don't know if they could see it. You know, Grandmaster Fat Flash and the Furious Five. The don't message. push me because I'm close, close to, the, to edge. the edge. I'm right. trying not to lose my head. To me, that's yeah. PTSD. Yeah. Um, when did you start? Attaching yourself to hip hop and, and noticing the correlations between what you're hearing and what you're feeling. Well, first of all, I want to say I agree with you with Post Malone. I don't fuck with Post Malone because of that quote. That's that's that's, that's why every time I hear him, I go m -m 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 mayonnaise music. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't fuck with Post Malone because of that. But um, I I felt it. Like I didn't know what anxiety was until nine years ago. That's when I got clinically diagnosed. Right. But prior to that, I had panic attacks before. I had anxiety attacks before. I just didn't know what it was. And songs like Beanie Siegel, Feel It in the Air, Feeling, yeah. Jay Z, Screech is Watching, you know, Ghetto Boys, Mind Playing Tricks on Me. Those three songs to me captured the feeling of what it, uh, what it was I was going through. And they actually normalized it. That's probably why mm -hmm. I never thought it was a problem. I never thought I needed any help. Because I just felt like for the lifestyle that I was living, being in the street, right. selling crack in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, that's how I was supposed to feel. I thought that paranoia came with the territory. Right. And for those who don't know, and you explained it in the book, and you explained it in the Black Privilege, there was a short time of Charlemagne the drug dealer. Oh, 100%. That um, was a bad seed from bad sperm, for real. For um, real. But you also talk about an, another thing that hip hop, the negative effects of, you know, you talk about songs like Onyx, like Throw Your Guns and Red Man, Time for Some Action. And... You know, watching, you know, old dog and men's society or yes. Bishop and Juice, and feeling like the times when you wanted to be vulnerable, the times that you didn't want to fight, the times that you didn't want to be an alpha male or, or a thug, that you felt like you had to because of the music and the movies yeah. and the images. That so, talk, as much as hip hop, I think helps. The, you it talk hurt. about it hurting you. Yeah, it hurt because you know, uh, men, especially black men, man from the hood, we can't be vulnerable. You know what I mean? That's why I named the book Shook One, because you know I'm a big proponent on living your truth. When you live your truth, nobody can use your truth against you. So it was like me kind of 
just embracing it and saying, yeah, we all are shook at times because the last thing you wanted to be growing up was considered a shook one. You couldn't be considered pussy. Mm -hmm. You'd be fooled out here. Right. You know what I mean? I had to stick my chest out. I couldn't be Donald Glover. I had to be Tupac. You know what right. I'm saying? Like you had to portray that thug image and it was almost just like a survival tactic. You know what I mean? It was, it was a lot of posturing going on. You kind of had to put that defense on so you didn't get bothered. And don't get me mm -hmm. wrong, there's always... Somebody in the hood way harder than you and way tougher than you and way really about that life. You talking about Darnell? I oh <laughs> man, Darnell. Darnell, that's not even his real name. Darnell, right. I get I think I get anxiety right now thinking about Darnell. I was watching Chris Rock bring the pain, and Chris Rock was talking about the first time he bombed, or one of the first times he bombed when when he opened up for Martin. Or he, you know, he had to come on after Martin or something like that. And he said, I still feel that beating. That's how I feel about the beating Darnell put on me. Wow. You know what I mean? Right. This scar right here. Is literally from an ass whipping Donnell gave me, and it had swole up to like some kilo, and I had a bunch of tissue, and I had to get get it cut off dec a decade or so ago, and I still got that scar right there. Mm. So it's just like yo, and and he's doing life in prison right wow. now, cause he killed somebody's mom. Wow, you understand what I'm saying? So it's just like that's the type of people I grew up around. We all grew up around those right. kind of people, so I had to have some type of posturing about me. But guess what? I could have. You know, just nerded it all the way out, which I should have, and probably never ran into Darnell ever because I'd have been running in a whole different circle. Right, you know what I'm saying? It's going in the woods too, Absolutely. just, just sneaking. Nah, man. Um, and you know, there was times in the book where, where, where you talk about kind of your anxiety or your paranoia or whatever helping you. Um, there was a time when you had this tremendous feeling that the cops were going to come bust you yeah. and your crew. And you went home yeah. and came back, and sure enough, and yeah. everybody told you that you you was being pussy, yeah. you was being paranoid, you shook, yeah. take a chill pill, yeah. and it actually came to pass. We used to, you know, we used to call the hood. I used to hustle at Queensbridge. I know, <laughs> I know, we was, I know, it's corny as hell. But my, my man Jarrell Garnett, rest in peace. You know, we used to trap it his his uh, his crib. You know, because at the time his mom had gotten married and moved out, so he had the house to himself basically. So we was hustling out of there. And um, like they used, to, we used to call it Queensbridge, and they used to call me Big Noid sometimes, just because I was so paranoid. So it was right. just about, and those were the panic attacks. Right. I didn't realize it, and that's why I don't smoke weed now, because I realized when I was smoking weed, I would have way more panic attacks, and my anxiety would be way more through the roof. When I stopped smoking, because I got on probation, and then tried to smoke back again. I really realized the difference, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I was like, yo, I really can't smoke. Like it, it drives my, it makes my anxiety crazy. And on this particular day, I was on probation and I don't even know what made me smoke that day because I had been stopped smoking. I took like a couple puffs and I was like- Out of here. Out of here. Like, I mean, everything was going in slow motion. Like I could see things that I didn't even notice before, like birds landing on telephone wires. And I remember just scaring everybody like, yo, the police are coming. The police are coming. Everybody's like, yo, what the hell is wrong with you, man? Don't, don't let this boy smoke no more. But everybody was outside. Everybody's like, I'm, I'm, this guy got me got me paranoid now. I remember burying my dope. I even left. Right. And for whatever reason, my dumb ass came back just to scare people some more. Right. And lo and behold, this dude named JJ, he pulled up, regular customer. He had an Easter egg. He opened the Easter egg. It popped open. I remember asking him, what's that? He's like, oh, it's just something I keep my dope in. He popped it open. And... Soon as he did that, it's like the van just came in. Just got Ooh. rushed. Man, that shit looked like a monster, like mm -hmm. eyes and a mouth. That's all mm -hmm. I saw. And we took off. And me, Jarrell, and, and one of my other cousins, we got away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Br bringing it back and hearing you tell that story. And, and you know, things like that, you can imagine the, the paranoia, the anxiety, the, the PTSD yep. of, 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 of a street life. You know, it reminds me of um, Scarface, My Mind's Playing Tricks on Me. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's a dope rap song. It's, it's, Descriptive, you can see everything he's saying, but it's like, man, he must have had to really go through that. I, I feel like mm. you had to really go through that to understand what he was saying. He wrote the forward um, in your book. What was it like working with Star Scarface? Because he he took it a whole nother level about the experience of the black man in America, yeah. you know, in the hood growing up and why mental health affects, particularly the black community as well. Well, you know, Rob, we talk about, you know, we talk about this a lot, just being in the positions that we in, how surreal it is, because I'm a fan mm -hmm. of Scarface. He's in my top five. He's in my top seven. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I grew up, you know, idolizing and worshiping him and like, that's my man. Like, we talk, you know what I mean? We text each other, we call each other on the phone. So just to be able to, 
I, I remember thinking that, like, who am I that I can just reach out to Scarface and ask mm -hmm. him to write the forward of my book? And he said yes with no problem, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just like, you know, anxiety playing tricks on me to me is the greatest hip hop record about anxiety ever. And I didn't mm -hmm. even realize that until I got older. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got older and understood what anxiety was and, and understood how I deal with it, when you go back and listen to that song, it gives it a whole new meaning. You realize Willie D, Bushwick, Bill Scarface, they were suffering from extreme anxiety. You know, back in the day, you just thought it comes with the lifestyle. It comes with the lifestyle of hustling. But when you talk to somebody like Face now, Face still has anxiety. He just has anxiety in a different way. He has anxiety based on society, being a black man in America, his kids, you know, being other people's on airplanes. kids. He doesn't even talk about his kids. He talks about other people's, other people's kids, kids as well. Kids, just yeah. what's going on with, with black children yeah. in America. All, all of that. And I mean that even even that gives you PTSD. Imagine coming from the hood and like, you know, you're used to getting those phone calls about, yo man, such and such got just got shot or such and such just died in a car accident. Like it's always some bullshit. Yeah. You know, like that right there gives you Constant PTSD, you know, like when I get, I'm like that now. I get phone calls late at night, I, and, and even now I can feel it, man. I can feel when like something ain't right, you know, mm -hmm. man. You get that phone call, and you looking at the phone, and you see who's calling you. You're like, I'm gonna answer this, and it's gonna be some bullshit, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So it's just like, you know, just working with Face on that, just even realizing, because I was, I wanted to talk to Face about mind playing tricks on me, and the anxiety he was feeling at the time. Mm -hmm. So he was able to break that down, but then just to realize, yo, he's still. Dealing with it now, just 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 through just just uh, different things causing him to be anxious, that normalized it for me too. It was like, okay, I'm not I'm not bugging, I'm not crazy. You know? and, and and what you're saying with this book too, you made the point earlier. I just want to stress again that in writing this book doesn't mean that you're on the other side of the tunnel where no life way. is. Like you still go through it. You 100%. still you still feel these things, man. One of the things in, in reading this book, I, I say I learned a lot about you and and. You know, we talk damn near every day, be it in the group chat or whatever, and we laugh at a lot of things, um, things that happen to us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, there's sometimes there's some things that you talk about in the book that I had I thought you were cool because you always look so cool on the surface. You know, you, you talk about um, you know Tommy and 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 being caught out there and pictured with her and the criticism you faced and you you know facing anxiety. Um, I want to talk about some very public moments. Like, let's go to the Birdman moment, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, in that room, it looked wow. You look cool. <laughs> yeah. was, was that an anxious moment? Was that an anxiety filled moment um, for you? Yeah, but not not severe because I feel like there's rational anxiety and irrational anxiety. Like I already knew how I had been talking about Birdman. Like right. I'm aware of the things I've said about Birdman. You know, so a few weeks prior. You know, um, Malcolm from Universal had hit me and he was like, yo, Birdman wants to come to the show. He was like, he called me at four in the morning, which isn't, you know, uh, un unreal because I'm up there every right. time. Yeah. yeah. So he was like, yo, Birdman wants to come uh, in a couple of weeks. He just want to make sure you're there. He told me the date and I'm like, yeah, cool. So that right there lets me know he's coming for a reason. Right. You know what I mean? He coming to like- You know he ain't got no album coming out. You know he ain't got no album coming out, <laughs> so he just want to come do some checking. I'm tired of this dude <laughs> talking about me or whatever. And so it's just like- I remember being in the studio, and once again, that's my anxiety, and 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 it, it preparing me because I'm like, yo, record. I said, I want y'all to start recording now. I told him that. I said, record immediately. Don't wait till he walks in the room. Start recording now. I don't know what even made me say that. I just was anxious. I'm like, and I'm watching him outside the glass, and he's pacing back and forth. And Eminem, I promise you, Eminem, lose yourself was playing. I think it was on the air or something. It was playing. Eminem Lose Yourself playing. And he was just pacing back and forth. I told everybody, I told Revolt, everybody, turn all the cameras on now. And when he walked in, he went right at it. Yeah, he ain't waste no time. If we don't, if we don't record when he's walking right in, we don't get none of that. Mm -hmm. It's only two minutes and 26 seconds. Yeah. Him walking in, saying what he said, sitting down, and then that's that. So if mm -hmm. I'm not feeling that anxiety... And that anxiety, you know, being the, that superpower that it is for me, because I always say I use the fear as fuel, mm -hmm. I don't get that thought to, all right, you'll press record right now and let's capture the moment as soon as he, as soon as he walks in. So it was anxiety, but like I said, it was a rational anxiety because I knew he was coming with something. It's funny, you just referred to your anxiety as a superpower and Kanye on his J album also talked about his, uh, his bipolar, bipolar yeah. as his superpower, right? Yeah. It, it, is that a thing? I, I don't know. I'm ignorant now, but I'm like, oh wow! Like I just um, correlated to at this moment. This wasn't a question on the card. I say, I always say, live your truth, right? It's the Eminem and Eight Mile theory. You live your truth, so nobody can use your truth against you. So, 
whatever somebody could say about you that could possibly, you know, hurt you in some way or be considered an insult, you know, you own it, you embrace it. So for me, the, the reason I call it a superpower is because I do use that anxiety, that fear mm -hmm. as fuel. You know what I'm saying? I always say that a lot of things that I do in my life, I thought I did them because I was fearless. I actually did them because I was scared. Mm. Like when my father said to me, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to end up in jail, dead, or broke sitting under the tree somewhere. Like that scared the me. The broke sitting under the tree is what, what you talked about that a lot. Yeah. Because right? th that, that, that was the option I saw the most. You know, right. after a while, I started to go to jail myself and people around me went to prison for five years, 10 years, stuff like that. And then around a couple of people around me actually got killed, you know what I mean, or, or died in car accidents, stuff like that. And, and, and so I started to really see like, oh shoot, what my father was saying was true. So if I don't change my lifestyle, I'm gonna end up one of these three mm -hmm. things and being broken under the tree is what I saw majority of the people from my hometown doing. So mm -hmm. that scared me to change my lifestyle. So that's what I say, I use the anxiety, I use that fear as fuel. Let's go to another moment. We're keeping in the cash money family, um, but less tense than that Birdman situation. It's your birthday this year. Mm -hmm. I remember this because I texted you. It was midnight. I, I texted you, happy birthday. Yeah. And we listen to Scorpion. Scorpion yep. comes out the same day. <laughs> same day, June 29th. And I'm up to Sandra Rose. As I'm texting you, happy birthday, Sandra Rose is playing. It's literally as I was texting happy birthday, Trey says, like, Charlemagne, I see the light in the darkest patches. And yeah. I said, oh, shit. I love it. <laughs> that's a shot. That, but that, that's, that, that, that causes a little bit of anxiety only because your, your, your social media feed blows right. up. You know what I'm saying? And your phone blows up. So I'm, I'm thinking, in my mind, when stuff like that happens, something happened. And I don't know what that something could be. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So it's just like, when I saw that initially, I'm like, oh, all right, that's light. You know, at the, mm -hmm. the initial thing, it's like, why is everybody texting me? Why is everybody tweeting me? And then when you hear it, you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's nothing. Right. Like, you know, you get those all the time. So, so you, well, you get those all the you time. You thought Sandra I, Rose I was crazy. Back bit. to back was crazy. That morning was nuts. But that was a good. I might send bottle the show. No, he sent the bottle. But I woke up because remember he he tweeted did that in the middle of the night. Right. We, and we didn't know that was right. coming. We didn't know it was coming. We knew Drake album was coming. Right. I didn't think I, I didn't know I was gonna be mentioned on it. But back to back, I woke up literally with like hundreds of text messages and right. people telling me like go to like I, uh, somebody one 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 of our mutual friends sent me a crazy text that I thought something was really going on. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. it was then you, I'm like, oh shoot, he said that. Like so, yeah, that was different because we didn't know that was happening. So when you wake up to 100 text messages right. and 5,000 unread messages on Twitter, you're like, yo, what happened? Did somebody die? You know right. what I mean? Right. And then you realize what it was. And you're like, oh okay. Right. It was funny. I remember one time when I was at MTV, we did the hottest MCs, and Pusha T didn't make the list that year. Um, who is one of my favorite rappers of all time mm -hmm. and a, a friend of mine and. He was doing an a interview, I guess, in the UK. So they said, oh, oh Pusha T talk going in on the hottest MCs list. So I just seen those tweets and I'm like, fuck, damn, I got to go against Pusha right now. Like, okay. I, I don't want none of this, but I was ready. So I was like, before I react, let me listen to what he said first. And he ain't say none of the shit that Twitter's saying that that's he was the saying. That's, that you know is what the problem. That's the other thing that gives you anxiety now because social media, man, social media is creating so many illusions. There was a whole chapter on social media, which I... I I started, you know, when, when I'm not as bad as I don't pee with my phone in my hand. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? What you talk about in the book, but you kind of went through this checklist of like weaning yourself just off your phone yes. in general. But a lot of the stuff that you were saying, waking up and the first thing you do is check your phone. I do that all the time. My phone is always in my hand. It, it started to make me think. I never thought I had a problem or seen anything in my life as problematic. And reading this book, it made me just like start to just do a, a self check. Like, hold on, am I? Can I be living better? Can, is there a healthier lifestyle for me? Yeah, because we so, don't come from that, Rob. Yeah. We come from praying. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Waking up praying, thanking right. God for another day of life. Like, what have we become? Right. When we're reaching for our phones before we get on our knees to, right. to think that higher power. You know what I mean? So for me, I don't, when I wake up in the morning, I don't touch my phone. I pray. I read my daily affirmations. You know, and when I, when I get in my, 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 my truck and I'm riding into work, I'm either listening to some 90s R&B. Our Oprah Super Soul conversations right. are nothing, you know. Just just getting my mind right. You say that in the book. So your, your quiet times is a lot of times they say their studies when the best ideas come is when there's nothing. Always in like the shower. I, that's why people 
yeah. get I get my ideas in the shower. I get my ideas when I'm driving, and you know I'm not listening to no music. I get my best ideas when I'm like on vacation, just sitting on the beach doing nothing. You know, what I mean, I get my best ideas when I'm just laying in the bed, staring at the ceiling, like because right. we we yo we're constantly on. Right. Like we don't even we, we're naturally anxious people just because of social right. media nowadays. Like we our, our phones are like buzzing and we're buzzing too. Like it's right. like your phone text right now. You just right. Sometimes you feeling for it because you just want to feel that buzz, or you just want to see if somebody texted you or tweeted you. Sometimes like, I feel a phantom buzz where it's like my phone's not even, even buzzing. I'm like, it's oh crazy. my god, that's that, that's the United States of anxiety we're in. I, I want to talk to you about. Let's go back to music a little bit because I, you know, I think we grew up in the era. I think right now we're in a space where um, there's this emo space where a lot of artists are um, talking about mental health and and how I feel is. A lot of artists have the freedom to do that when maybe when we were growing up they didn't. And even though, like I said, we had the scar faces, we had the message, we had we pop. had that. We had pop. Mm-hmm. Listen, the first time, the only song to make me cry to this day, and I always say it is, is Dear Mama. The first time I heard Dear Mama, my parents had split. My mm-hmm. mom's left. And my 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 brother was crying, my little brother was crying. I felt like I couldn't cry because I was like, man, somebody got to stay strong. Like everybody here is crying. Mm-hmm. Next day, I'm in my room by myself. Angie Martinez comes on the radio. We're going to play the new one by Pac, Dear Mama. And they play it. And that song allowed me to, to cry in the way that I couldn't in front of my brother or my mom because I felt like at 13, 14, I had to be the man and do it. So. We all Pac, felt like that. Pac definitely at the top right. of the list. And I know that's a tangent, but like we're on the subject. But now, a lot of artists are really talking about mental health. You know, artists are allowed to be emo. What, what do you think about the conversation today? You, you, you know, Lil Uzi Vert is, is kind of in the front of that movement. Um, Kid Cudi um, for this generation. You know, even Drake. Um, mm-hmm. And even giving props to Joe Budden. I think Joe Budden really, the mood music definitely tapes. Joe. Mood music tapes is yeah. about... Mental health. Yeah, definitely, Joe. And you know, leading up, so w- when we come to the little Uzi Verts and, and things like that, you know, um, all my friends that push me to the edge, all my friends are dead. Mm-hmm. It's a dark song. Um, Lucid Dreams yeah. by, by, by Juice World. What do you think about where we are now with, with the music and mental health as a conversation with the music? Um, I applaud all of those people. You know, I, um, I, I, I wonder what got them in that headspace. Like a lot of those young kids are dealing with a lot of things. But also a lot of those young kids are on drugs, right. you know, and you know those, those the drugs may make them feel may make them feel that way, because I don't really see too much. Um, I see self awareness going on, but I don't see too much self help happening. You know what I mean? Other than other than people medicating themselves, you know, through drug use. Mm-hmm. So what I would like to see is if you're so aware of your feelings, you're so aware of your emotions, you're so aware of your anxiety, you're so aware of your depression, then when are you going to go get help for that? Mm-hmm. As opposed to being on every opioid under the sun, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's that's what I would like to see the next level be. I can't really say these kids are talking about mental health. They're just aware of what it is that they're feeling, but they're not going to do the work to repair some of that damage. Because as soon as I, you know, I've, I've been aware of, of my anxiety since 2009. That's when I first mm-hmm. got clinically diagnosed with it. But this last year is when I first started going to get help. To try to get a handle on it, because it just became too much. You know what right. I'm saying? Like the more, the more your lifestyle increases. You know what I'm saying? Especially in this business. Mm. You know what I mean? The more your star rises, so to speak, or the more money you make, and the more things that you're responsible for. You know, the more you're a target. Right. You know, like I, I told my wife, you know, months ago, early this year, I'm like, yo, the worst feeling in the world is when you know people are just sitting around plotting on you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I miss the good old days when they would just run up on you and try to fight you. Get over it. <laughs> At least you know what it is. Right. That's the most rational form of anxiety right. there is. Somebody right. pull a gun on you, which has happened to me. Right. You know, you know what that is. You right. know, somebody you get into a fist fight with somebody, somebody run down on you, somebody start, try to jump you, you know what that is. It's all of this other attacks that be happening, lawsuits that people don't know about. Wow. You know what I'm saying? You know, social media attacks, you know, you know, uh, stories that that come out about you that aren't true and people try to weaponize those against you. Like when you know all that stuff is happening, like that, that'll drive you crazy. Right. You know? That'll make you you gotta go try to sit down with somebody. Right. Therapy wise. I, I, I wanna get back to this point about the the drugs and, and the self-care. You know, one thing in reading the book that I didn't realize and, and 
just you know, hip hop culture, black culture is, is so fucking inventive, right? Mm -hmm. And and creative and everything, no, nothing exists in the vacuum. So so you talk about um the concept of uh, you know, we used to say when we were young, if you was bugging out, yo, take a chill pill. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like slang. And yeah, we didn't yeah. really know what that meant when we said it, but you talk about seeing your your your, your aunts or your grandmother, I'm not sure, taking nerve pills. And yeah, my every grandma. generation called it something different. Mm -hmm. But the chill pill is the the Xanax. The Xanax. Yeah. Right now. So so we're seeing, we're literally seeing rappers, people, youth around us take a chill pill and it be damaging. Yeah, because they 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 take it too much. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I got I got friends who battle with anxiety and, and deal with the depression and they are on Xanax and other stuff, but they take the right amount. I got right. friends who have panic attacks before they get on a plane and they were afraid to ride planes, but they take you know, some Xanax or something prescribed by the doctor, they take the right amount and they good. Like I remember, I saw some criticism for Drake. I think it was on Sickle Mode. He was like, oh, it took half a Xan, 13 hour flight, and I'm like a light. And people were like, oh, he's promoting drug use. And it was like, oh, no, he's kind of talking about it the way it should be done. Right. Like that, that it took a half a Xan. That's probably right. what the doctor prescribed him to take. Right. Drake may deal with anxiety. We right. don't know. Right. Like, listen, man, some of the biggest performers in the world deal with anxiety on a high level. But that's why I say it's such thing as rational anxiety and irrational anxiety. It's the irrational anxiety I'm trying to get a hold of. The irrational anxiety is when you got those thoughts that are running through your mind and you don't know where they're coming from. Like, why am I all of a sudden bugging out? Like, like last week, Angela E did a, uh, in her front page news, she talked about some kids, some, some human trafficking going on in Michigan. Right. And they found a bunch of girls somewhere or something. Then I got on social media and I saw Skills repost somebody in Virginia, talking, some woman talking about some guys kidnapping women in Virginia for human trafficking. Right. And I'm like, yo, my I got daughter daughters. 10. I got three yeah. daughters. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm thinking about my daughter on the way to school. And I'm like, I had a panic attack. I had to go yeah. in another room and take some deep breaths. Wow. That's, that's just, at the, just at the mention of-, of Just the at thought. the mention, so, you know? That's, that's the irrational anxiety. You know what I almost said under my breath? I don't know if they caught it. I said, that's crazy. <laughs> and I, I think we got to kind of stop that. I caught myself yeah. as I said it because you, you don't mean it. You know what I'm saying? Like, this doesn't make you crazy. This nah. is, you know, it's something that, it's that life. we go around. It's life. Um, Going back though, you know, another one thing that you said too is is is, is you're waiting for for rappers and a lot of these artists to to do the the self help part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've lost. I mean, we lost Lil Peep this year. Um, you know, I remember watching that the Adam Twenty Two No Jumper video with Bunk and him looking like he was about to OD. And and recently lost a, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, and a great artist, Mac Miller. Mac Miller. Yeah. Um, and I listened to. I haven't been able. I used to listen to Mac Miller's swimming album. Every morning, that was the the. It was calming for me, right? And, and I started my day with his album, and he knew that. And he and I spoke about it, and I haven't been able to listen to it since he passed. I just, I'm just not ready yet. But he did have a song called "Self Care," like you you know whatever Mac was dealing with and struggling with, you know he was the type of artist I, I feel like who was aware of what his demons were, what his struggle mm -hmm. was, and and there was some attempt to really attack it head on. So, I mean, do you see that? I know you said that you were waiting for mm -hmm. artists to kind of take that step. I just wanted to give Mac as, as, as an example, because yeah, I, I don't think we're I, devoid of that completely. Yeah, I forgot about that record. It was, I was, it's funny you say that, Mac, because I got into the, my truck the other day and the Mac Miller's album randomly came out. It was the swimming album. It was on my playlist. I forgot what song popped in, but I, I did the same thing. I had to fast forward. I couldn't even listen to it. I went to the next yeah. song. And it's a great body of work. I just, yeah. just not yet. I just can't. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, Mac is a sad situation because Mac is somebody that we would have those conversations. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like, like I, I don't, I don't kick it with too many artists like that. But when Mac lived in Brooklyn, like I actually would go to Mac's crib. Same. You know what I'm saying? Same. And like me and Mac would talk. Like I, I like Mac a lot. And then we had the whole MTV Two connection because you did you know, the voiceover, the intro to his, the most dope family. Yeah, because yeah. I was over, I was at MTV Two when he was yeah. there. So it was just like we had a connection. We'd always end up being places together, and we would talk about all of that stuff. And Mac was. Mac was very self-aware of his depression, you know, very self-aware of his anxiety. It was something that he kind of like embraced. And that's what I say, that's what I mean when I say, even when we talk about, you know, these kids going to get help, it's like, yo, we talk about self-care, what was self-care to Mac? You know, or self-care to any of these kids? Are they going to sit down with a right. therapist? Or are they sitting around with their boys, smoking the weed and popping the pills and, and 
You know, that's right. what they call self care. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's what scares me about mm-hmm. all of these dudes. Like, I don't want them to be self medicating, man. Like, right. actually go do the work. Go do the work. You go sit down with a therapist. Nothing make nothing is crazy about you sitting down having a conversation with somebody. Like a lot of these artists, like somebody like Wale, we both fuck with Wale. That's I my man. Wale. Wale said he'll come to the breakfast club and this. I'll be like, yo, Wale, you should go see a therapist. He's like, this is my therapy. Right. No. Go see a therapist. So I hope that with this book, I hope that people read it and be like, yo, there's nothing wrong with going to sit down and talk to somebody. That's why I even get, not upset, but as many trends as Jay-Z has set, mm-hmm. you can listen to Jay-Z now, uh, watch his past couple of interviews, whether it was the Rap Radar joint yeah, with Elliot and B-Dot or the uh, one he did with the, I think it was the New York Times. New York Times, yeah. You can tell he's been in therapy. But he's talked about it. But not enough. Right, okay. You know what I mean? It's been mentioned. He, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't talk very. He might have did two. I think in the two interviews he did, he did. He did yeah, mention it. Right? You'd like I, to see him go deeper. Yeah, just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I'd like to know just a little bit more of the process that he went through because we're talking about people that are supposed to be the most. For, historically, we've looked at them as the coolest, mm. most confident, fearless people in the world. Mm. You know. And, and and not saying they aren't all those things, right. but it's different things that scare you at different points in your life, or different things that put you in different positions in your life that have to be that have to deal with them and handle them differently. What made Jay Z sit down with a therapist? Go to the therapist. You know what I mean? I would love to hear the backstory behind it all. I think that that could benefit benefit a generation way more than him telling telling us to take off our jerseys. Did right? You know what I'm saying? Um. You know, one of one of our heroes, one 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 guy that that we looked up to musically and still look up to musically, I believe. But hip hop is confused about is, is Kanye West. Mm-hmm. And, and you had an interview with him this year, which was really poignant interview. We we talked about it. It felt like it was the most clear. And even the things that he talked about that I didn't agree with during your sit down with with you and him is is like okay, I, I can kind of see where he's coming mm-hmm. from, and I wanted to understand where he's coming from. In your book, you talk about. You talk about being anxious about that interview, um, about the things of how we're going to edit, color correct it, where is it going to yeah. live? Like you were very anxious in that way, but you, you said Kanye would, you believe, was anxious in a different way, which led to the TMZ interview, which then spawned the slavery was a choice. Yeah. Um, comment. Talk about that. I feel like, um, I mean, I, f- I feel like when you got two people who both have anxiety and two people who are always trying to control situations, which is something that I realized you can't do a long time ago. That's why I really believe in the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Like there was no, there's no such thing as a perfect rollout. So it was just funny that we taped that interview mid-April and was just trying to figure out how to roll it out, roll it out, going through the edits of it. Me saying, nah, put this back. Him saying, y'all want to take this out. Like different parts of the interview. And then finally the interview coming out on May 1st, which is the first day of mental health Awareness Month, which lets me know the universe is always conspiring. Because you didn't plan that for that to happen. Not at all, you know. So, so it came out uh, May first, and then he went to TMZ because I think he went to TMZ because he was just. <laughs> I don't. I don't think he understood how the interview was going to be received. Like that wasn't enough for him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because like you're going back and forth, wondering how I'm going to present this, how I'm going to present that. It came out. People listened to it. They got an understanding of where he was coming from, even with the Trump stuff, right. you know? And then you went to TMZ and ruined it all, you know right. what I'm saying? Right, right, so right. I, just think, I just think it was the anxiety of that interview coming out, him not knowing how it was going to be received. And you know what? Maybe even him forgetting that the interview was coming. Right. I'm serious. Like maybe him forgetting the interview was coming. Like it was almost like he was reacting to something that hadn't even happened yet. Right. He didn't know how, to, he didn't know how exactly the interview was going to be received. He's probably used to... People pushing back, mm-hmm. so he didn't know how it was gonna be received. So he goes to TMZ, defending himself against something that was received well. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know his album, yay, and not that you're his his doctor, or his therapist, or know exactly or everything that's going on with him, but you know he he makes the album cover in the last minute. I was in Wyoming. You you were in Wyoming. You had to leave early. Yeah, I was day. there that day though. I was there. I was there when he took that picture. But he he takes the picture. Yeah. He makes the album cover on the spot and, and talks about. On the album cover, you know, bipolar. You know, the 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 first um, song I thought about killing you today. Like, you know, what I'm saying, and 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 these really kind of dark thoughts that are in music. And I think at the time we were listening and may not have realized um, you had a talk scheduled with him. And I want to put this into context because mm-hmm. um, to promote the book, 
And it was with the New York Times and mm-hmm. John Carmonico, who regularly do these talks and they charge admission fees mm-hmm. to get in. Um, and you guys canceled the talk because you thought it would be counterproductive I at did. this point. Um, yeah. what, 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 um, what led you to that? Because... I mean, you were trying. I know you were excited about the again. Yo, it's Kanye West. Um, there's there's a world where it could have been a very productive conversation Absolutely. that people could have got something from it or better understanding about themselves. Um, at what point did you realize that that was going to be counterproductive and, and and you had to pull that off the table? I realized right after he uh, met with Trump at the White House. You know, because I understood then that that the, the narr- whatever narrative we was trying to push, which was the narrative of mental health, you know, just trying to eradicate the stigma. And I thought that Kanye was such a perfect person to talk to because in every interview he did, he talked about it, but people just kind of breezed by it. Like, you know, I, I even when I, when I was talking to him, I was like, wait a minute, you, so you're bipolar and hold on, you on medication, what you on? Like we talked about it and it was one part where we, where we actually had took that out and I was like, no, you have to leave that in. The reason you have to leave that in is because you're going to help other people that are going through whatever it is that you're going through. So when I saw him do the interview on TMZ with Harvey, he talked about not being on his meds no more. And Harvey just kind of like breezed past that. And I was like, see, the conversation we need to be having with Kanye is about mental health. If I'm being open about my mental health, he's being open about his mental health, we can sit down, have John there, and just have this beautiful conversation about the experiences that we're both experiencing and you know how we're dealing with it. But then when I saw him do the interview with Trump, he was like, yo, I'm not bipolar, he got misdiagnosed and he was just suffering from sleep deprivation. And, you know, I was just like, hmm, that's something he got to go figure out. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that's something he got to go figure out. Like, I can't have him up on this stage and we trying to have a conversation about mental health, but you just said last week, you're not suffering from anything, you know? Mm-hmm. And then just everything around it with the, his political views and all of that, like, those don't bother me. I just know that if you're any type of journalist and you're sitting there talking to him, you have to ask him about ask that. that. So that would have been the whole conversation. That would have totally distracted from whatever discussion we were having about, about mental health. So I just felt like it would be counterproductive to, to put him on that stage in, 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 his, in his current mind state. Right. That's all. Yeah, I was just thinking about him the other day and just really hope that he's all right. I, I know he's a he's sensitive to just the vibrations out there and, and even canceling Kanye, like, I don't know, man. I just want Kanye to get better, man. I mean, the funny thing about Kanye, and I keep telling everybody this, is, like, I never was, like, a huge Kanye mm-hmm. West fan. Like, I like I, I like Ye, you know what I'm yeah. saying? I recognize his greatness. I love College Dropout, Late Registration, Graduation, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, great albums. But, like, I love Jay. I love right. Scarface. Yeah. I love Ghostface. You know what I mean? Right. That's what I'm into. I love Killer Mike. Right. That's the type of stuff I'm into. T.I., Jeezy. Yeah. But I always respect Ye. But the thing about Ye is, this is who he is. When everybody's going left, he goes right. right. That's historically we've seen. Historically, it's just now he's really going right. Like, right, right. you know what I mean? Like MAGA had right. Right. You know? Right. But he's always done that. When everybody's doing the street stuff, he's the guy come through with the pink polo in the backpack. You right. know what I'm saying? Like he's right. always the one that's going totally against right. the grain. So right. it's just kind of like, yo, if you loved Ye then for that, this really shouldn't stop your love now. You don't have to like it. Right. You don't have to agree with it. But you gotta admit, this is classic Kanye. Yeah, it's, it's definitely classic Kanye. I, I don't know if it doesn't stop my love. It doesn't inspire hate out of me mm. for him. It doesn't inspire, like, I don't like it. I don't love it at all. I don't hate him for it. me personally. Like, I, yeah. I'm just like, all right, cool. I'm gonna sit this one out. Yeah. Um, Cause I don't know what's going on. And, 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 and even I don't on, hate him. Even like, with him, when we talk about mental health, like, you're know, trying to eradicate the stigma of mental health in our community. You know, what if he really is going through things? That that's what I think about. Like you know, what I'm you, you know, you talk about the stress of waking up and and seeing what your social media a uh, hundred mentions, a thousand mentions, whatever. You imagine know what he and, goes through. Imagine what he goes through, <laughs> and and you know, it's not necessarily to sympathize with somebody because I you know I think Trump has given us policies that hurt people. Absolutely, like, absolutely. So aligning yourself with Trump is hurtful. Absolutely, you know, but. All right, cool. If that's what you're gonna do, we're gonna be over here, you know. But what, maybe make come back and join us. If we can help you, we're gonna help you. And I'm I'm with you. I'm just yeah. saying, like, what if he really is going through something? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like some people look at him and like 
they see signs of of somebody that's manic, manic going through, mm-hmm. you know, like being mania. You know what I mean? Right. Like you look at him, and you're like, okay, yeah, he clearly going through something, right? If you think that, if you really think that, how can we shit on that? Right. If anything, you'd be trying to get him some help. Right. Some real help. Encourage right. him to get real help. Like, nah, you don't need to be off your meds. You need to be on right. your meds. Like, nah. Somebody said you got misdiagnosed. You need to go see a second opinion about that. You know what I mean? Because right. it's just like alcoholism or any type of drug use, right? The first sign of there being a problem is denial, right? Right. So if you told me that you got an issue, but now you're denying you got an issue, and we're looking at you and we're saying like, man, everything ain't adding up, right. it's kind of hard to, like, why, why are we shitting on that? Right. As opposed to like trying to go get him some real help. I agree with you 100%. You know? and, and, and hopefully he gets the help that, that he needs. Um, damn, it, it got really... <laughs> serious. I want I want to end it on on a cool, fun yeah. kind of hip hop note. It has nothing to do with nothing, but you know this this thing which I just started doing on this show, um, because we're all hip hop fans, man. I, I really 100%. feel like I'm grateful for hip hop. Hip hop got me here. We are both here because of hip hop. I want to I want to ask you. I'm gonna put you on the spot. I want to ask you the verse, any rapper, any song that. At any given moment, you could rap at the drop of a dime. You just know, like the back of your hand. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna challenge so you. So many. <laughs> it's funny because I'm sitting there looking at into the Wu Tang, and I can name, I can do Inspector Deck from Cream. I can do Riz. I mean, Method Man from Shame on the nigga. Yeah. Uh, that was my favorite brother. Do your Rizza, your Razor. Hit me with the major, the damage, the clan, understand it. Be flavor, gun it. I'm gonna come in at you. First, I'm gonna get you. Once I got you, I got gotcha. you. You could never capture the Method Man stature. Gotcha. From rhyming to rapture, got niggas resigning. I'm after my style, clever. I put the fucking buck in the walk and I'm terror. Raise the soft, I shove The head from the soldiers, I'm better than my competitor. Give me competitors, whatever. Let's get together. You know what I mean? Like hip hop is <laughs> fuck over here. You understand? Oh, oh. I'm just, so I'm just I'm looking at this. I'm like, yo, that's Wu Tang. Like, that was the. I just that's the that's I still listen to that to this day. Crazy. Right. That you know? was, first of all, that was hard. Like that was dope. I, I, I just want them to those are the kind of rappers I used to like. Right. I mean, I still love Charlamagne Meth. the God. Five percent. Yeah. 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 It, it makes sense. But Meth was like an acrobat. See, that's what I talk about when, when we talk about rap. Anybody can like you really anybody really can rap. Right. Everybody can't MC. Right. It's a difference between having being a gifted MC and just somebody who can rap. Like right. that's a gift to be able to right. do this. this, 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 this. Like, oof. And he and he still got it. I wanna on Logic's on Wu Tang Forever. I think Meth got the best bro. I heard Meth, I was like, damn, he still got it. I haven't listened to it yet. But it's still got the it. last Wu Tang album, Meth still got Meth it. Meth bodied every record. And it was a small point where I felt like Meth had fell off. Right. Right. And I'm it's just so funny, the, the quick hip hop story. I don't I did I talk about that in Shook One? I think I did talk about that in Shook One. When I used to work with Wendy Williams, mm. and like, you know, um, Wendy had got on the radio and divulged some information about Meth and Man's wife that she shouldn't have divulged. Yes. And Meth, you know, did a video where he was going in on Wendy, yeah. you know, talking about Wendy used to be sniffing coke and giving head to people in Staten Island, whatever, whatever. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm riding for Wendy at the time. That's who. She put you on. That's so, yeah. So when, when Wu Tang. Who I still at 40 years old want to get a tattoo of. Like when they put me in that position, I'm like, that's the woo. Like, I can't do that. But at the time, Meth had fell off lyrically. And so it was like, I used that to rationale. To rationalize getting at him. And I was, it was I was just saying, like, oh, meth whack now, whatever, whatever. And I remember one time, um, Wendy's husband Kev came on the radio and he was going in on meth. We both were going in on meth. Kev left. Phone phone rings from the front desk like 10 minutes later. Uh, Method Man is in the lobby. I'm like, what? <laughs> now, mind you, I'm new to New York. I've only been in New York maybe a year. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, this ain't South Carolina. You, you get at somebody here, they coming, right? Yeah. So I call Wendy's husband. I'm like, yo, Meth here. I'm like, Meth who? I'm like, how many Meths you know? <laughs> Method Man. Meth's in the lobby. He had just left. Right. He's like, well, go see what he want. You're not gonna turn around, like, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, go see what meth want. Like, anxiety going through the roof. I'm like, what's the worst they can do? Beat me up. You know what I'm saying? We on the 44th floor of a building, yeah. like whatever. As I'm walking down the hall, I'm thinking, I'll hang you off a 12-story building. I'm <laughs> oh, like, fuck it. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I go in the lobby. And it's funny now when I when me, me talk, me and Meth talking about this on the Breakfast Club. When I walked in the lobby, I saw Meth 
And in my mind, Meth was there with two of the most craziest looking dudes I ever seen in my mm. life. Like them dudes you saw in the train on the Bring the Pain video. Right, right, That's right, who right, was right. with him, right? In my mind. Right. He told me later on, I was like, he was like, yeah, that was my driver and somebody else. You was hallucinating, whatever. <laughs> so me and Mef sit down, we talking, and he's like, yo, you said I used to be one of your favorite rappers. You, you, you really think I'm, I'm, I fell off? I'm whack now? I'm like, well, they, they, I'm going to get beat up anyway. Yeah. I'm like, yo, you used to be one of my favorite rappers, but now you have fell off. And I quoted one of the lyrics. I'm like, yo, you used to, I quoted Summer mm -hmm. Shame on a nigga, and I was like, you went from that to saying, like, I'm the one like Tracy McGrady. Yeah. Mef looked at me and Mef said, I respect that. Yeah. Straight up, he gave me a pound, and it's just like, <sighs> all the anxiety just <sighs> dropped to the floor. Yeah. And then he was like, you know, just tell Kim, I mean, tell Wendy them, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have to, you know, I'm, I'm gonna see them soon, you know what I mean? And he was, I don't even think he was on no beef. He was just like, I wanna know who gave her that information right. so I can go sue the hospital, right. you know? So right. that's just a story of uh, hip hop anxiety, I guess. I yeah. don't know. That reminds me of my main old story, but we're going to save that for another day. Maybe I'm going to save that for the book, but Charlemagne the God shook one anxiety playing tricks on me. Yes, sir. Out October 23rd. Yes, sir. October 23rd. You can pre-order now at seethebook.com. Uh, you know, if you're watching this past the 23rd, just go to your local bookstore and grab it, man. Man, and I tell you, to be a bestseller. Yes, sir. Shout Rob, out to Rob, thank you, my brother. Peace, Love, man. man. Peace.